بسم اللہ الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ ولا علیہ وصحاب اجمائن اما بعد فاؤز باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح علی صدری ویسر علی عمری وحل الاختت من لسانی اب قولی السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان شاء اللہ وی اسٹارٹنگ آف آن اے ٹاپک وچ از گوئنگ ٹو بی آفٹر دا لائف آف دا پروفیٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم وچ از دی دا لائف آف دا خلفاء راشدون سو ان شاء اللہ وی آر پلاننگ ٹو کور دا لائفز آف فور آف دا خلفاء اور فور آف دا رائٹلی گائیڈیڈ کیلفس ایز دے آر نون آف اسلام دا فرسٹ ون آف دیم اوبیسلی از ابو بکر صدیق رضی اللہ عنہ اینڈ ابو بکر صدیق وی کین سی ہیئر فرام دس میپ دیٹ دس از دی area that was uh, covered by Abu Bakr Siddiq or the area that was under the uh, leadership of Abu Bakr Siddiq after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In his first speech, Abu Bakr Siddiq, he said the following things. He said, I have given the authority, I have been given the authority over you and I am not the best of you. If I do well, help me and if I do wrong, set me right. Sincere regard for truth is loyalty and disregard for truth is treachery. The weak amongst you shall be strong with me until I have secured his rights, if Allah wills. And the strong amongst you shall be weak with me until I have wrested with him, from him the rights of others, if Allah wills. And so this is what is very important which he said. Which is, and he said, obey me so long as I obey Allah and his messenger wasallam. But if I dis, disobey Allah and his messenger, you owe me no obedience. Arise for your prayer, Allah may have mercy on you. The essence of the leadership of Abu Bakr Siddiq we find is that he is one of those leaders that this is not a uh, dictatorship he is telling the people that if you find anything wrong with me or if I if you find me disobeying Allah and the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then please show me no obedience as a matter of fact he also said that if I do well then help me in that and if I do wrong then set me right so from the from this from the get-go we understand that Abu Bakr Siddiq was one of those people who was uh, highly honest in his in his work we find that apart from the many uh, achievements that he did one of the major achievements of his was the preservation of the quran in the written form as we find that after the victory over musaylima kazab uh, who was the false prophet uh, in the battle of yamama in 632 we find that uh, many of the hufaz had died and so umar radiallahu he actually recommended or suggested that because so many of the hufaz of the Quran have died, we now need to start preserving the Quran in written form as well. And uh, under the uh, supervision of um, Zayd bin Thabit anhu, this process began and uh, this was during the caliphate of Abu Bakr Siddiq, uh, which was one of the major achievements. Other than that, we find that he was uh, regarded as one of the greatest companions of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, also known as the best human being after the Prophet's uh, of Allah and we find from Sahih Ahadith where we know that uh, one of the first people to enter into Jannah after the Prophets is Abu Bakr Siddiq. He is also of the Ashra Mubashra, the 10th promised paradise and so these are, yani Ashra Mubashra are those who are uh, the 10 companions who were given the glad tidings of Jannah whilst they were still alive. So think about this that if you and I are given the glad tidings of Jannah while we are alive, uh, what would we do? I don't know about you, but I would be celebrating and going crazy. But subhanAllah, these people who were promised paradise in their lifetime, they did not change. Rather, they became even more humble because you know the, the fruit tree that bears fruit, it becomes more uh, humble. And so this is how the Ashra of Bashra were. When they were, even though they were told by the Prophet that you are a person of paradise, their attitude was even better than before. We find uh, this hadith from Sayyid Bukhari, uh, narrated by Jubair bin uh, Mut'im, he reported that a woman came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said that, uh, asked about a matter, and so uh, he asked her to come back at a later time. The Prophet Sallallahu asked her to come back at a later time. She said, tell me if I come later and do not find you, meaning, what if I come back and you are not there by that time, meaning you have left this world. Um, so Jubair bin Mut'im, he said that it seemed that she meant by this that you may not be alive when I come back. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that if you do not find me, then go to Abu Bakr. This is from Sahih Bukhari. Um, that the Prophet ﷺ, he trusted Sayyidina Abu Bakr so much. And this is one of the hadith where the scholars say that this is a hadith that sort of signifies that the Prophet ﷺ was talking about succession after him. That after me, you should go to uh, Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And we find also that um, the Prophet ﷺ, towards the end of his life, when he was very sick, he uh, asked for Abu Bakr Siddiq to lead the people in prayer. 
that when they said that, you know, who's going to lead the prayer, uh, he said, let Abu Bakr lead the prayer. And Sayyid Aisha narrates, she actually mentions, because she was the daughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq, and Abu Bakr Siddiq has the honor that his daughter was married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She mentions that when the Prophet Sallallahu told my father to lead the prayer, I tried to convince the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not to let my father lead the people in prayer. Because she said that, you know, because the people, they, you know, they had such an affinity with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I knew that anyone, anyone who would come next, the people would definitely not like him as much as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I didn't want my father to be that person. Because, you know, no one can compete with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu So she said that I didn't want, I was the only reason why I opposed this was because I knew that whoever comes, no matter who he is, no matter what type of Kari he is, you know, he will not compete with the Prophet Sallallahu So therefore, I, I didn't want that for him, but uh, the Prophet Sallallahu insisted that Abu Bakr Siddiq should lead the prayer. And we find also in this that uh, during the time of uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, al although his Khilafah was only two years, his, his Khilafah, his rule was very short. And the Khalifa, by the way, is a position that is for life. You know, it's not that you will be Khalifa and then there will be elections after four years and then somebody else will come to power. If you're a Khalifa once, you will be Khalifa till the end of your life. So Abu Bakr Siddiq only lived for two more years. And um, he also actually died at the age of 63, just like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so he only was there for two years. And during this time, he took on the Romans and the Persians, the uh, Sassanid and the Byzantine empires apart from going on to two major fronts, taking on two superpowers of that time, at the same time he was finding, fighting an internal conflict as well, because these are known as Ridda Wars. Uh, what are the Ridda Wars? There was some, it's from the word Murtad. There were people who became, who left the fold of Islam. How did they leave the fold of Islam? Because as soon as the Prophet left this world, what happened was a lot of Arab tribes who were previously, mashallah, Muslim and everything, they refused to pay uh, zakat, they refused to do certain obligations of Islam. So Abu Bakr Siddiq, he uh, asked them that, you know, this is, I mean, if um, you were doing something at the time of the Prophet I mean, I'm not the one who is going to not let this happen. You will do the same thing still. And so at that time, some of the companions, they uh, were of the opinion that perhaps we should not go to war with these people. They are still Muslims, they say, they still say the kalima of la ilaha illallah. I mean, if they don't pay zakat, I mean, it's okay, we can sort of overlook that. But the mentality of Abu Bakr Siddiq at that time was that by Allah, if they even gave a rope at the time of the Prophet you know, not under my watch will they leave that. They will pay zakat. I'm, I'm not going to be one of those caliphs who will, in his rule, zakat will be just obliterated. Yani already from the five pillars, one pillar is gone already. So he said, no, no, no. If they paid zakat, then they will pay even now. So this is something that they had to do. So Alhamdulillah, the, scholar, uh, the, uh, the, the Sahaba later commented that uh, we realized that Abu Bakr was, uh, was upon the truth and we were the ones who were uh, not correct at that time. In his achievements, we see that Abu Bakr Siddiq had the distinction of being the first caliph in the history of Islam, yani after the Prophet and he was also the first caliph to nominate a successor after him. He actually nominated uh, Umar ibn Khattab to come after him. And he was the only caliph in the history of Islam who refused uh, to the state treasury at the time of his death the entire amount of the allowance that had been uh, drawn during the period of his caliphate. Uh, whatever he took as a salary, because you know the Khalifa would get a certain stipend. At the time of his death he gave, he collected all of that, whatever he had, and he gave it all back to the state. SubhanAllah, this is the level of his leadership. You know, instead of taking that salary, at the end of his life, he, he just gave all, of, he collected all of that, and at the end he gave it back, meaning he took nothing from the state. Um, he was the first Muslim ruler to establish the Baitul Mal, the concept of a Baitul Mal, that we need to have a uh, central location where the money can be collected for the Muslims. He also has the honor of purchasing the land for Masjid al-Nabawi. So, SubhanAllah, do you know all of the Muslims that are going to Masjid al nabawi today? Uh, who gets the credit for this? Abu Bakr Siddiq, because he was the one who purchased this land. He was, even before Islam, he never used to drink wine or worship others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was, he was uh, yani upon, he, he never used to worship any idols. He was also 
uh, very good at interpretation of dreams and it is known from various hadith that the Prophet would often times ask him that Abu Bakr why don't you interpret this one and then when he would interpret he would say this is a good interpretation or he would say that this part is true but this part is not true so he was correcting him whilst so he was training him in the art of uh, interpreting dream because also uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq was very good with knowing people, uh, knowing their backgrounds, their lineages, their families and so on. He was very well versed in the Arab tribes and so on and so forth. Um, he was one of the, he was the closest friend rather of the Prophet ﷺ. He has been mentioned in the Quran as the sahib of the Prophet ﷺ when he was in the cave and he was there next to the Prophet ﷺ in most occasions you can find. As a matter of fact the Sahaba would say that every time we would talk about the Prophet ﷺ, we had to talk about Abu Bakr and Umar. That it was always the case that these three, and you know there were so many stories about the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr and Umar. Uh, you know, the Prophet Abu Bakr and Umar, you know, climbing up the mountain, coming down, going here, going there. Always uh, you, you find a lot of mention of the, of the three of them. Um, Umar ibn Khattab once said, and this is from Al-Bahiqi, and this has been classified as Sahih. Umar ibn Khattab, he said about Abu Bakr Siddiq, he said, if faith of Abu Bakr was weighed against the faith of the people of the earth, the faith of Abu Bakr would outweigh the faith of other people. This is how much was his Iman. And you know the hadith where one time he brought everything from his house to give peace of Allah. Oh, Umar ibn Khattab that day thought that today I will bring half the contents of my house. So if, if I have like 10 sofas in my house, 5 peace of Allah. If I have 2 cars, 1 peace of Allah. If I have, you know, Eight carpets, four feasibility. So everything in his house, you know, split in two. I mean, imagine if we had to do that today. Abu Bakr Siddiq brought all the contents of his house. Every single thing that was there, he just brought it that day. So you find how he was excelling in all of these things. So this was from uh, 632 to 634, uh, which was the rule of uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq. After him was Umar ibn al-Khattab. And uh, we see here uh, on the map, uh, the kingdom expanded exponentially at the time of Umar al Khattab. And so he uh, was the Khalifa from 634 to 644 CE. Uh, this is approximately 10 years we, we find that he was the Khalifa. Now, what happened during his time? One of the hadiths which I start off with, which is from Tirmidhi, where the Prophet said about Umar al Khattab that if there was ever to be a prophet after me, that would have been Umar. Um, and but, but he said that but there is no other prophet after me. So I am Khatim al there is no other prophet after me. But if there was one, then it would have been Umar. This is the status and the maqam of uh, Umar al-Khattab. Umar al-Khattab as the Khalifa, he once said that I will not calm down until I put one cheek of a tyrant on the ground and the other under my foot. I will not calm down until I put the cheek of the tyrant or the zalim on the ground and my foot on, on, his, on his other cheek. And he said, for the poor and the weak, I will put my cheek on the ground. L look at the, the contrast uh, between his personality. That on the one hand, that's why he's known as al Farooq, The one who can distinguish between the truth and falsehood. So on the one hand, he was very strong against the disbelievers, strong against those people who are tyrants. And on the other hand, very soft-hearted towards the believers. In the year 638, you know, something amazing happened, which was the conquest of Jerusalem. And this credit goes to Umar al-Khattab, who... Uh, conquered Jerusalem in a uh, bloodless uh, conquest where he just walked into Jerusalem while on uh, the riding animal and even on the riding animal his servant was on the riding animal he was walking along with it and this had been mentioned in the text of the Jews uh, that you know the the person who will take over Jerusalem will be the one who will be walking and on his clothes will be you know certain number of patches and so on all of this became true and this is one of the great honors that uh, it was um, taken from the Byzantinians and it came to the Muslims uh, under the rule of Umar al Khattab Umar al Khattab in terms of his uh, personality in terms of his attributes he was a very tall man very uh, big and strong he used to be a he used to be a wrestler at one point in his life um, he was raised in a very rough and harsh environment he was a shepherd and uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he made dua for him. He made dua even when he was not a Muslim. He made dua that, Oh Allah, give me either Amr bin Hisham or Umar ibn Khattab. Give me one of these two. Amr bin Hisham here, by the way, is Abu Jahl. So the Prophet ﷺ made dua for either of them. And there are scholars who have actually talked about what were the qualities of Abu Jahl. And if he would have accepted Islam, what would have happened? And so what about Umar ibn Khattab, how he benefited Islam? So Allah ﷻ willed that. 
uh, Umar al Khattab should accept Islam and uh, the, the, the famous story rather is that he was out to uh, kill the Prophet he had a sword in his hand he was out to kill him and one of the companions came and asked him where are you going he said I'm going to kill him today because you know he's splitting between the families so he told him that you know uh, what about your own house your own sister is a Muslim so Umar al Khattab decided to go back to his own house and he found out that his own sister uh, had accepted Islam and so long story short uh, that was the day that he realized uh, when, he, when he read the ayat from Surah Taha and he read that and Alhamdulillah he became Muslim and then he went to the Prophet and he said I have accepted Islam and you know that's when Islam really uh, got on a very high tangent because the Prophet said that those who are the best before Islam are the best after Islam also. The, those who are best in their times of Jahiliyyah are best even when they come into Islam. So this is a very uh, amazing thing that happened to Islam and from that point onwards Islam became public. Umar al-Khattab went door to door knocking at people's houses and saying Alhamdulillah become Muslim. Alhamdulillah become Muslim. You know because previously people were hiding their Islam. If you come out and you say that you are a Muslim people would beat you. But who is going to beat Umar al-Khattab is a big man, he's very strong, you know, he used to be a wrestler, nobody would, would actually mess with him. So Alhamdulillah, this is, uh, and even when he migrated by the way, people when they migrated from Makkah to Medina, everyone left in secret. Umar al-Khattab left in public, in broad daylight, he went to the Kaaba, he said, I'm going to make hijra towards Medina. If anyone wants his mother to weep for him, follow me. If anyone wants his wife to become a widow, follow me. Meaning, don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. This is the attitude of... Umar al-Khattab. Um, his legacy as a caliph, his legacy as a khalifa is that he said that even if a dog dies hungry on the banks of the river Euphrates, Umar will be responsible for failure of duty. And even if a dog dies at the bank of the river Euphrates, I will be responsible for that. Meaning that under my kingdom, I will not allow any injustice to take place, even to animals. So this is the justice of Umar al-Khattab. When, and there are tons of stories, there's so many stories about how he was as a Khalifa. Personally, one of the best things I like about him uh, is the fact that he used to, uh, you know, change his appearance at night. And he would go out into the streets. He would wear a costume, he would wear clothing that, you know, he would, for example, pretend to be a Bedouin Arab or he would pretend to be you know, somebody, uh, not the Khalifa basically. He would wear clothing of the common men. And he would go out into the streets and look at what's going on with his people. So what an amazing thing this is. Imagine if now our Prime Ministers did that. Imagine if the President did that. Imagine, you know, people in the street, you know, uh, I often think that if, you know, if uh, the Prime Minister had like a Suzuki FX, like an old Suzuki FX, you know, 1980s, and he would wear like normal clothing and just go about, you know, and it would be amazing for him to just know what the people are doing. You know, get out from the, uh, you know, uh, presidency or the or the prime minister house and just have a look at what's going on uh, and see what the people are like and this is exactly what Umar al-Khattab used to do at one time the, the the famous story which we know where it was almost Fajr time now he was roaming around and he went to a house and he heard there was a young girl talking to her mother and the girl was actually just had just taken the milk out of the cow and the mother said that you know why don't you add some water into this and we'll get more profit and she said but you know, uh, the, the Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khalifa will not like this. So the mother said that the Khalifa is not here, although the Khalifa was outside listening. She said the Khalifa might not be here, but the rub of the Khalifa is here. And he, Allah is still watching us. O Umar al-Khattab was so impressed by this girl. He didn't even see her, by the way. He didn't see who she was. But the next morning, he sent the rishta or the proposal for his son's hand in marriage. Uh, and he, because he was like, because see, he was thinking about raising a generation. If this is going to be my daughter-in-law, and if she is going to raise my grandchildren, then my grandchildren are in good hands. Not looking at other things, looking at you know the honesty of the person, looking at the taqwa of the person. So this, by the way, this this girl became the grandmother of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, you know, the second Umar as he is known as. One of again one of, and they say that if there was a fifth uh, Khalifa from the Khulafa Rashidun, then it would have been Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So imagine what an amazing uh, legacy this was. We also know of the story where uh, Umar al-Khattab again, he was dressed in different clothing and he was going around and he uh, went past a tent and he heard a woman uh, who was trying to cook something and there were kids crying in the background. So he asked her if everything was okay and she said, no, it's not okay because my kids are very hungry. And uh, he said, but what are you, you cooking here? She said, I'm just cooking uh, some, it's just water 
and I put some stones in this. And I'm just shaking it because of the sound, the kids think I'm cooking something, but there's nothing, I'm just cooking water here. So Umar al Khattab said, but why did you not go to the Bayt al-Mal? Why didn't you talk to the Khalifa and you know, ask him for... So she said, this old woman said, that uh, you know, it is the Khalifa who should ask me if I'm well fed or not. I, I, I'm not going to go and beg him for food. I'm, I'm not going to go and ask him for her, like, any money because I'm a respectable woman. It's the Khalifa's duty that he should come and find out who's poor and who's not poor. Umar al-Khattab, you know, he felt as if, you know, the world had just turned upside down for him. He said, you just wait right here. And he went running to the Bayt al-Mal. And upon his own shoulders, he picked up the, the, you know, the flour, the bread, the this, that. He took a lot of stuff with him. And one of the companions saw him carrying the stuff and he, he knew this is Umar al-Khattab. And he said, Amir al where are you going? Come on, let me take this stuff for you. He said, no, 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 let me carry my own burdens. He said, on the day of judgment, you will not carry my burdens, let me carry my own burdens. So imagine, the Khalifa of the time the president, the prime minister, what is he doing? He's carrying the stuff on his back, he's going to the house and what did he do? He, 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 he told the woman, you wait on the other side. And he began to cook for her. So he began to prepare a meal and when he made the meal, he said, there you go, now you feed your kids. And this is a letter, please show this to the Bethel Mall tomorrow, you have a certification from the Khalifa, you can go and eat it, whatever you like, inshallah. So imagine this is, I mean, this is one of the things that I really like about him, how he was completely a people's person. He would go out and he would find out who's the pun, yani the, the people or the one who's suffering and he would help them out. Um, once he was, um, there was a camel that had run away from the Bethel Mall. A camel fled from the Bethel Mall. And Amir al muminin he went after it. You know, they said that the camels run away. He said, wait, I will go find it. So he went and he, uh, in search for the camel. Somehow, after a while, he, he actually found it. He tied it to a tree. And because he was tired, he just, it was afternoon time. So he rested under the tree and he went to sleep. At that time, a Persian delegation came. Very hi-fi people, you know, very upper class, elite. A delegation came from Persia. And these were very uh, noble people. So they came and they asked, uh, we are here to, this, this was the delegation. So, so they said, we are here to see the Amir al we're, we're here to see your Khalifa. Where is he? So one of the people told him that, oh, actually uh, one of the camels left the Bethel Mal, so he's gone to find it. He said, which way? Said, that way. Okay. So it, they actually went after him. And lo and behold, they saw him sleeping under the tree, next to a camel that was tied to the tree. And so they waited for him to wake up. They didn't wake him up. They just waited for him, like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. After he woke up, they said, uh, you ruled by justice, therefore you became safe because of that. You are now able to sleep peacefully anywhere. And, he, and they said, our leaders, they don't rule by justice. So even with the best beds and the best pillows and the best mattresses, they don't get any sleep. And say, so here you are, you're sleeping on the ground and you're sleeping in peace. Because they, they looked at it, this is a mural mumini, sleeping on the floor, subhanAllah. And look at how peaceful he is. Look, no bodyguards, no nothing. He's got no tensions whatsoever because he's ruling with justice. Who would want to kill him? Who would want to hurt him? Nobody because he's ruling with justice. No, when you don't rule with justice, then you feel for your life that maybe somebody will kill me. Umm al-Khattab, actually one of the uh, Persian, Persians uh, did actually make an assassination attempt on him. And it is because of that that he died. He was uh, leading the Fajr Salah when he was attacked. And we find that he died the, the death of a martyr which was actually foretold by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when once he was, they were actually climbing the battle of, uh, they were actually climbing the mountain of Ohad and the mountain began to shake. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the mountain that, O Ohad calm down because on you is a Prophet of Allah, on you is a Siddiq and on you are two martyrs. Two martyrs, meaning uh, Umar al-Khattab and Uthman ibn Affan. Okay, so uh, now coming to the uh, rule of Uthman ibn Affan, who was the Khalifa from 644 to 656 CE. And during his time also the uh, empire, it expanded quite a bit. And one of the amazing things about Sayyidina Uthman is that he was given one of the titles, one of the most amazing titles and honors as Zunnurain. So Nurain means the possessor of two lights. And this was given to no man on earth, by the way. This title has not been given to any man in human history. 
Uh, this was given to him because he was married to two of the daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One because you cannot marry two daughters at the, at the same time. He was he was married to one. She passed away by the will of Allah, and then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam married his other daughter to him as well. And no person in human history has been married to two daughters of any prophet, let alone any, any prophet. Nobody has been married to two daughters of a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except Uthman ibn Affan. So he has a high maqam. He was first married to Ruqayya radiallahu anha, and with her they migrated to Abyssinia, uh, while the Muslims were being, uh, were being persecuted in Makkah. And they later came back to Makkah when they found out that you know things were um, coming back to normal, although they weren't. Uh, Sayyidina Ruqayya, she, when she came back, she was suffering from malaria and smallpox. They came back to Medina. So she was uh, seriously ill, she was suffering from malaria and smallpox. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at the time of the Battle of Badr, he told uh, Sayyidina Usman that you stay with Ruqayya because she was not well. And so he said that you stay here, although he wanted to go and participate in the battle, but he asked him not to go. And he said that you stay here and you will get the reward of the Mujahid who is participating in the battle. And not only will you get the reward for those participating, but the spoils of war or the booty of war, you will also be a shareholder in that. So um, this was told to him by the Prophet ﷺ. And although on the, uh, on the victory of the Battle of Badr, uh, on the one hand the Muslims were celebrating, they were very happy, but on the other hand, that was the day that Sayyidina Ruqayya passed away. And when the Prophet ﷺ came back from the Battle of Badr, he found that Sayyidina Usman was actually burying uh, Sayyidina Ruqayya. Later on, the Prophet ﷺ married uh, his second daughter, Umm Kulthum, also to uh, Sayyidina Usman, which is actually a great testimony for the man. Because imagine that you marrying the two loves of your life, the two uh, daughters, the two jewels of your eyes, you know, you're marrying them off to the same person, one after the other. And according to the narration, we find that the Prophet said, even if I had a third, I would have married her because people started saying that, you know, maybe Sayyidina Usman was, uh, there was some evil omen or something, but the, but the Prophet completely denied that and said, if I even had a third, I would still marry her to Usman. And according to Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu, he mentions that, actually the Prophet said that if even if I had 40 daughters I would have married all of them one after the other and if they passed away I would have married all of them to Sayyidina Usman ibn Affan um, In the famous hadith of the Prophet he, we know that the Prophet raised his hands and he said Oh Allah I am pleased with Usman so you too be pleased with him. Uh, the modesty of Sayyidina Usman is also well known when uh, Sayyidina Aisha once observed that uh, the Prophet was sitting and his leg was showing a little bit because you know the, the panchas are a little bit up. So she said that when Abu Bakr Siddiq came, the Prophet didn't fix himself. When Umar al Khattab came, he didn't fix himself. But when Sayyidina Usman came, the Prophet quickly fixed his uh, clothing. Um, and so she asked him that, you know, why when my father came, you didn't do anything? When Umar came, you didn't do anything. But when Usman came, you fixed yourself. He said, uh, Should I not be shy of a man around whom the angels are shy? And should I not be shy of one, even whom the angels are also uh, actually shy. Um, we all know that Sayyidina Usman was a very generous person. He used to always give fi sabilillah. Um, and there are tons of examples. I mean, I don't have time to go through all of them, but there are tons of examples how he purchased a well for the Muslims. And on many, many occasions he gave fi sabilillah. He was extremely wealthy, but at the same time he never well, uh, let that wealth enter his heart. It was only in his hands. Uh, at the Battle of Tabuk, he uh, donated so many times, he, you know, the Prophet asked that who's going to give peace of Allah and he uh, raised his hand and he said, Ya Rasulullah, 100 camels, I want to donate peace of Allah. And then the Prophet asked again and again he raised his hand and said, Ya Rasulullah, 100 camels, peace of Allah. And then again 100, again 100 and he kept doing it until 960 odd camels he gave loaded with goods. And the Prophet came down from the member and he said, uh, go Usman, do whatever you will. Today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you till the day of judgment. Meaning, do whatever you like from now on, Allah has forgiven you. So you, you find that these people were given the glad tidings of Jannah so many times in their lives. Yet, they became even more humble as a result of it. The Khilafah of Sayyidina Usman lasted for 12 years in which there was a lot of uh, wealth that was uh, attained and acquired. Uh, the Muslims truly prospered and he also 
uh, was responsible for preserving the original copy of the Quran which is in use today as we speak. Um, he expanded Masjid al Nabawi, uh, the Muslims developed economically uh, and there was a lot of work done on the, pub on the public service sector. Uh, his reign was from Africa all the way to China including many other places in between. Uh, Sayyidina Ali's Khilafa began from 656 CE to 661 and during the time of Sayyidina Ali there was not any expansion of the Muslim Empire, it stayed where it was. As a matter of fact inside there was a lot of civil uh, disobedience and these type of things began to happen. Sayyidina Ali, Alhamdulillah, he was a very noble person, he was from the family of the Prophet Alhamdulillah, he was bestowed with a lot of wisdom, uh, he was a brave warrior, he was good in his judgment, he was from the family of the Prophet he was his cousin as well as his son-in-law. He was married to Sayyidina Fatima Radilana, who was, as far as we know, the princess of Islam. And one of the four women out of, uh, who will be the leaders of the women of paradise. So Alhamdulillah, this is a blessed household. Well, one of the um, main things that I'm uh, sharing with participants in these seminars is a kind of uh, brief uh, biographical walkthrough of the actually very very complex and for Muslims uh, inspirational life stories of the uh, first four successors which is a kind of word or translation that we use for the Arabic Khalifa sometimes anglicized as as Caliph successors to the uh, temporal authority of the uh, the founder of the religion and these are famously Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman and Ali who uh, take up the torch on behalf of a community that really has been shattered, I think, uh, emotionally and potentially uh, shattered politically as well by the fact of the sudden, uh, unexpected uh, death of, of the Holy Prophet. Uh, there was a real sense in the air, I think, that what had been achieved during the Holy Prophet's really short, tumultuous 23 years of ministry, of, uh, of taking the Arabs from paganism to monotheism, taking them from a state of, sort of vendetta-inspired lawlessness to uh, unity under a single law, from taking them to having, from having no particular belief in life after death to being really focused on, on the life to come. That the, the intensity and the absoluteness of that uh, transformation which had been brought about during those 23 short years was something that was precarious and there was a real danger of black backsliding. So clearly the succession to the Holy Prophet's temporal authority and uh, the handing on of the instruments of state and the traditions of Muslim statecraft as these were uh, being uh, developed at the time was something of momentous importance, not just for the continued viability of Arabia as a new, really for the first time in its history, uh, unified uh, political entity, but also for the ongoing uh, viability of the religion itself. So there was a real sense of uh, challenge, a real sense of threat in the air. And the processes whereby these four successors, these four caliphs, these four khulafa came to succeed and to wear, as it were, the mantle of, of the Holy Prophet, each was quite different. And that in itself becomes enormously momentous and significant in subsequent Islamic history because they are setting the precedent for what we nowadays would regard as a political process. Should it be through primogeniture, should it be, as was normal in the seventh century, uh, a monarchical system? Should it be something akin to what nowadays we would regard as being a form of popular uh, sovereignty or representation? Should it be democratic? Should there be an electoral college? Should there be an elite which got to choose the successor? All of these were hugely important questions and completely unknown territory for the early Muslims and also really for the world as it existed at the time because these were not monarchs in the traditional sense. These were people who were appointed through various constitutionally uh, defined principles, each in uh, a specific way. And each of these individuals, and I've been trying to, to drive this home in the course of these lectures, possessed of a very particular spiritual and moral type. Uh, they were not um, carbon copies of each other by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, it would be hard to imagine for saintly human types that were more different from 
Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman and, and Ali, the first four successors to the Holy Prophet's authority. So it's a complex story, but clearly the subsequent story of the Islamic world and of the world in general, because the whole world really was completely uh, transformed by the, the fact of the rise of Islam, nothing would be the same again anywhere, uh, really rode on the, the, the stability uh, with which those four men grasped the, the, the tiller of the ship of state and uh, the fact that Islam is today accounting for well over a quarter of the world's population is in some measure uh, testimony to the success with which those four heroes, saintly heroes, rose to face that challenge. Well, the immediate successor to the Holy Prophet's temporal authority was uh, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Uh, he was uh, very close to the Holy Prophet in a number of ways and had been his deputy uh, in prayer, for instance, which is a very formal collective statement of the community's identity. The Holy Prophet insisted uh, that Abu Bakr was the one who would lead the prayer when the Holy Prophet in his final sickness was too ill to do so. He was a person who was uh, diffident, uh, cautious, quietly spoken, frequently overcome by tears, constantly aware of the reality, the presence of God in this world, somebody who responded immensely to the, the divine power in, in the forces of nature, uh, the beauty of the world, uh, a, a dutiful a spouse, a dutiful father, and of course his beloved uh, daughter Aisha became the beloved wife of the Holy Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa So uh, really two very close friends, and this relationship is, is documented in the Holy Quran itself. The second of the four friends, as they are traditionally called, is uh, Omar ibn al-Khattab, who is a very different model of human perfection. It's very important, I think, and I've been trying to drive this home in these, these presentations, to understand that uh, one of the gifts that true religion gives us is to open up and broaden the spectrum of human types, of models of human perfection. Real religion, a major world religion, is not in the business of imposing a single template on human beings. And certainly in the case of Islam, there's never been an attempt to impose a type of sort of uniform Arabness. The Muslim world is enormously diverse. The Indonesians are very proud of being Indonesian Muslims, having their own specific dress, and the Turks, and the Nigerians, and so forth. The idea of Islam as a kind of Arab imperialism is very far from, from the mark. And so each of these four men have a very distinctive way of being 100% Muslim. They are absolutely careful to place their feet carefully in the footsteps of the religion's founder. But at the same time, they have different souls, different personalities, different strengths, different qualities. So the second caliph, Omar ibn al-Khattab, is a man of rigor. He's a man who is passionate for justice. He's a man who can become angry. He's a man who's a great warrior. He's a man who is a hero, who is physically very strong. And through the force of whose personality and whose determination, really the potentially fractured situation of the early Muslim community uh, is restored to a state of, 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 of rude and youthful health. Uh, the third of these four friends, these four, su four successors, is uh, Othman bin Affan. Othman bin Affan represents uh, the purification of what you might call the aristocratic principle in Islam. The Holy Prophet's revolution was not a revolution in the European vein, such as was the revolution of the French in the 18th century or the revolution of Lenin in Russia, uh, because the established forms of life were, where they could be purified, were purified and were not overturned. And the existing aristocracy in the Holy Prophet's native city of Mecca continued to be regarded as an aristocracy, and this was particularly important for the nascent religion. So the third of these four friends, Othman bin Affan, represents everybody's ideal of the gentleman, of the nobleman, who is humble, who is beautifully spoken, who is concerned for his flock, who has a sense of noblesse oblige, who has a sense that uh, to be born into uh, a situation of nobility and privilege carries with it certain responsibilities and, and, and duties.
The fourth of the four friends on whom I'll be speaking tomorrow is uh, Ali bin Abi Talib, who represents, again, another very different type. And this is the type of spiritual inwardness reflected in a chivalry towards the world. And his symbol is historically the, the two-pointed sword. His sword, we are told by the historians, had two points, Dul Fakar. And this is regarded as, as a sign of the indivisibility of the inward and the outward struggle. If one wishes to struggle for greater justice in the world, in government, in society, in uh, public institutions, one must first of all master oneself. One must overcome the lower tendencies to exploitation, to anger, to vengefulness. One must be beautiful within before one stands a chance of making the world without beautiful. And so uh, Imam Ali, radiallahu an, the fourth of the four friends, becomes for Muslims everywhere and it's very much a uniting figure. The emblem of the one who is the master of the inward science of chivalry of the soul and therefore becomes the very model of chivalry in the life of, of politics and uh, the, the guidance of, of state. Okay, so it is uh, interesting to note one of the things that you find in uh, the Caliphate or the Khilafa is that uh, each one of these Khilafas, starting from the Khilafa of uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, who was uh, nominated, uh, yani we find that he, through the ahadith that he was, the Prophet alluded towards him being the next Khalifa. After that we find that uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, he nominated Umar ibn al-Khattab to come after him. Umar al-Khattab formed a majlis shura in which he asked people to vote and to select and so people did give their own opinions in that. What you have to understand is that Khilafah is not something that is uh, genetic, it's not something that passes on from father to son and so on, it's not like that. It's not something of a kinship where you know you have to, uh, your son takes over after you and your son takes after you and or there is any uh, type of, you cannot buy your way into it, you know, this is not something that happens like this. It is something that is passed on, the people are involved, so inshallah when you find, there's so many different ways in which a Khalifa is nominated. So we have to keep in mind that when you look at history, please look at it in depth, study it academically and understand uh, that Alhamdulillah we are people who are Muslims, we love uh, the Prophet ﷺ, we love Allah ﷻ, and we love the companions and the family of the Prophet ﷺ, and that's how we should inshallah interpret these events. So inshallah I hope that this was beneficial. Barakallahu feekum, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.